December 1948 was the coldest winter ever for Chiang Kai-shek. The news of the defeat at the front was like a chilling north wind that blew into Nanjing. I wish to express my appreciation for the interest and sympathy shown to my country by our American friends. Song Mei Ling, Zhang's wife, flew to the United States in a final plea for help. A few years before, she had been greeted by a crowd. This time, she appeared utterly alone. In 1948, Zhang Kai-shek sent Song Mei Ling to the U.S. asking for more aid, but the request was denied. The ally had left and the communist army was approaching the Yangtze River. Defeatism was rife among senior Nationalist Party members. Many were contemplating the idea of a divided China and advocated peace talks. In the government, the voices for peace talks were getting louder. Domestic media argued that without talks, there would be no American aid or mediation from the U.S. Moreover, for talks to happen, Chiang Kai-shek had to resign. The popular slogan at the time was, when Chiang Kai-shek is gone, the communists will not come. Peace hinged on Chiang's decision. This inevitably led to another battle inside the nationalist government. Bai Chongxi commanded tens of thousands of troops in central China, which constituted the nationalist army's main force. Zhang sent Bai a telegraph, requesting him to move his troops to Nanjing for defense. Bai refused. On December 24, 1948, Bai sent a telegraph to Zhang, urging him to give the Nationalist Army some time for supply and rearrangement. Otherwise, the Nationalist Army would soon collapse. Bai had the armed forces under his command. His support for peace talks shocked the politicians in Nanjing and was the first shot fired at Zhang. Zhang was unable to decide if he should resign. For the moment, he didn't respond to attacks from his political foes. Zhang felt that if resignation was necessary, he should be the one making the decision instead of being forced to step down. He also felt that with the ongoing war, his resignation would damage morale among the soldiers. But the issue was unavoidable. The media criticized Zhang as being the one man who desired war, while the whole nation desired peace. One week later, Bai Chongxi sent another telegraph, urging Zhang to start peace talks immediately. Senior officials like Cheng Chen and Zhang Zhen also demanded peace talks and Zhang's resignation. For Zhang, this was a conspiracy by the Guangxi clique to force him to step down. In his telegraph to Song Mei Ling in the U.S., he said, the political situation will soon change due to the Guangxi clique, not the communists. The Guangxi clique were the first to go against Zhang. 
Their leader, Li Zongren, intended to use this opportunity to increase his power. The Guangxi clique represented the biggest anti-Zhang force in the Guomindang or KMT. Li Zongren and Bai Chongxi were both from Guangxi and both had defeated Japanese troops during the Sino-Japanese War at Taiyarzhuang. Their relations with Zhang had always been tense. Li decided to run in the vice presidential election in 1948 and defeated Zhang's choice, Sun Fu. For Zhang, it was a big loss of face. Li Zongren's success in becoming vice president was the biggest defeat of Zhang's political career. Although Zhang and the Guangxi clique had disagreements, they had also worked together for a long time. When it was announced that Li had won the election, Zhang would not even stay in his residence in Nanjing. An incident at the inauguration ceremony infuriated Li Zongren. Thereafter, Li repeatedly mentioned this incident as an example of Zhang's lack of generosity. Li Zongren told me that Jiang Kai-shek was a narrow-minded man. He said he had asked Jiang about what to wear at the inauguration ceremony. Jiang told him to wear his military uniform, and Li Zongren did. At the inauguration ceremony, Jiang was wearing a Chinese robe and jacket. By comparison, Li looked like Jiang's military assistant. He felt that Jiang deliberately humiliated him. It is hard to determine the real reasons behind the disagreement between Zhang and Li, but the incident clearly showed the aversion and distrust between the president and vice president. Whether the Chinese Civil War would end in peace or in war was an issue that caused the power struggle between Zhang and the Guangxi clique. The U.S. strategy in the Far East was also involved. This was why John Layton Stewart, the U.S. ambassador to China, sent his assistant Philip Few to talk to those in the KMT who favored peace. In Zhang's telegraph to Song Mei Ling, he wrote, the recent rumors about peace talks and my resignation came from the U.S. Embassy. Zhang later wrote in his diary that the U.S. Embassy in China had become the headquarters to overthrow Jiang Kai-shek. Indeed, Ambassador John Layton Stewart used different channels to indirectly show U.S. support for peace talks. The Americans felt that, with Jiang Kai-shek in office, the Chinese Civil War would accelerate, so they wanted someone else to be the president. Many people in the nationalist government also wanted a new leader, who would guide the peace talks. Several forces pushed Zhang out of office. First was the Guangxi clique, second was the Americans, third was the communists, and there was also the media that wanted peace. Despite pressures from home and abroad, Jiang Kai-shek calmly analyzed the situation in his diary. If he stayed, the government would remain solidified, and he could wait for the situation to change. If he resigned, the deadlock would be broken and new opportunities may arise. Resignation was not giving up.
On January 1, 1949, Jiang gave his New Year's speech and declared that he did not care about staying in office as long as peace could be realized. This indirect message of possible resignation was a way to put his opponents at ease as he waited for their responses. Some people in the government did not want Jiang to step down. They worried that the government would fall apart. However, the majority wanted peace talks and Jiang's resignation. In his diary dated January 1st, Jiang wrote, The failure and humiliation I have experienced this last year was unprecedented. From this day on, I shall be a new person. He even wrote optimistically, Maybe after the New Year's speech, my opponents will cease their conspiracy against me. On the same day, in a telegraph to Song Mei Ling, Jiang wrote, I cannot step down immediately. I will hold on until the last minute. These words show that Zhang had not made the final decision and was waiting for a miracle. Zhang was facing a dilemma. He felt that he had no other way to go. However, ten days later, Jiang received the bad news of the Nationalist Army's total defeat in the Huaihai campaign. Jiang knew at this moment that it was time for him to step down. Back then, the battles between the Nationalists and the Communists had almost come to an end. Jiang felt that he had done his best, so he decided to resign on January 21st. On January 10th, Jiang sent another telegraph to Song Mei Ling, urging her to return and stand by him. Jiang was literally surrounded by enemies. On January 16th, Jiang visited the mausoleum of Sun Yat-sen. He knew already he was about to leave the capital, Nanjing. But he probably had no idea he would never again have the chance to return to Nanjing. In his diary, Jiang described his feelings visiting the mausoleum of Sun Yat-sen before his departure. Li Hoju, the last monarch of the Southern Tang, wrote a poem to express his feelings when his kingdom was defeated. I think, at the time, when Jiang bid farewell to the mausoleum of Sun Yat-sen, he experienced very similar emotions. At 10 a.m. January 21, 1949, Jiang met with all senior party members in his Nanjing residence. He announced that, for the sake of peace talks with the communists, he would resign. Several of those present burst out crying. Some cried and asked him not to leave. But Jiang's reply was, I did not decide to go. In fact, some people among you forced me to go. In a bitter tone, Jiang said, I have decided to resign. He then presented a document for Vice President Li Zongren to sign. The air was thick with tension and distress. Li Zongren signed his name, his wish to replace Jiang thus granted. Immediately after the meeting, Jiang left for the airport 
and returned to his hometown in Fenghua. After Zhang had left, Zhang Qun gave Zhang's official announcement of resignation for peace to Li Zongren to review. Li felt the announcement had some hidden meaning. Zhang quoted the second half of Article 49 of the Constitution, which stated, in case the president should, for any cause, be unable to attend to his official duties, the vice president shall act for him. Starting from January 21st, Vice President Li will assume office as the acting president. It is said that Li was strongly against the use of the title acting president. He also doubted if Zhang had actually resigned, because the announcement also included the wording, for any cause, be unable to attend to his official duties. The difference between acting and succeeding as president could allow Zhang to resume office at any time. When Wu Zhongxin and a couple of others went to talk to Li Zongren about the rights of an acting president, Li had once said, President Zhang can take a break. If the peace talks with the communists fail, then we will ask him to resume office. According to Li Zongren's memoir, Secretary General Wu Zhongxin was about to publish Jiang's announcement without seeking Li's consent. At first, Li refused to do so, but Wu advised and warned Li of his difficult situation. Hey. Hey. Wu Zhongxin asked Li Zongren, how many guards do you have? Li replied, All my guards were sent by Jiang Kai-shek. Wu replied, Then why would you dare refuse to make the announcement? Despite the fact that he had Bai Chongxi's full support to become the real president, Li Zongren was concerned about political reality and media reaction. He did not want to waste any more time fighting Zhang, so he assumed office as the acting president on January 24th. When Li Zongren assumed office as the acting president, he had some very difficult situations to resolve. Fu Zhuoyi, leader of the Nationalist Army stationed in Beijing, had just surrendered to the Communists. Meanwhile, Premier Sun Fu, who had competed against Li during the election, announced that the Executive Yuan would be relocated to Guangzhou. Without support from the Premier, Li would not be able to enforce his executive orders. Sun Fo was never friendly with Li Zongren, and he didn't want to take command from Li. Also, it's quite likely that his decision to move the executive yuan was influenced by Jiang behind the scenes. Even though Li later persuaded Sun Fo to return to Nanjing, Sun's relocation of the executive yuan had upset the legislative yuan, and a confidence vote was to be held. On March 8th, Sun Fo resigned, and Ho Yingqin became premier. With the communist army getting closer, and all the political turmoil, how could Li Zongren fulfill the promise of peace? He first called Mao Zedong and proposed peace talks, then sent two non-governmental delegations to test the response of the communists. However, the communists always doubted Li's ability to control the situation and were thus reluctant to start formal negotiations. At the time, Mao Zedong raised questions about the center of power in the nationalist government. Was it Nanjing, Guangzhou, or Fenghua? Even before the peace talks took place, the communists had announced in January 1949 
eight conditions for peace talks, which included punishing war criminals and abolishing the fake constitution of the Republic of China. The communists announced a list of 43 war criminals. The first one on the list was Jiang Kai-shek. The second one was Li Zongren, and the third one was Bai Chongxi. Some intellectuals and ordinary people hoped that the civil war could be resolved peacefully. So, the communists had to consider the possibility of peace. The communists finally agreed to peace talks. On March 25th, after consulting Jiang Kai-shek, Premier He Ying-chin authorized Jiang Zhizhong and Xiao Li-zi to form a delegation for the talks, and the official negotiation was scheduled to take place in Beijing. In the KMT, Li Zongren and Jiang Kai-shek both wanted to negotiate the option of a divided China with the communists. The communists could rule the area north of the Yangtze River, the KMT, the area south of the Yangtze River. In fact, Jiang did not believe that peace talks would work. But he expressed that as long as the national interest was not sacrificed, he would not oppose them. Zhou Enlai was the communists' leading negotiator. With victory virtually assured, the communists expressed their determination to cross the Yangtze River by any means. The KMT's dream of a divided China was crushed. On April 15th, the communists proposed the internal peace accords. Their conditions for peace included punishing war criminals, incorporating the nationalist army into the communist army, and control of all areas under nationalist governance. They also set a deadline of April 20th. The conditions set by the communists were so strict that one can say they had literally told the KMT to surrender. With absolute advantage at hand, the communists would never agree to the KMT's suggestion of a divided China. They wanted to liberate all of China. Later, after occupying Nanjing, Mao Zedong gave the order to track down the escaping nationalist army. So, I believe that the communists actually used the peace talks with the KMT purely as a strategy to win the war. Originally, Li Zongren was about to accept the conditions, but Bai Chongxi opposed, because the deal was basically a surrender. They had also showed the deal to Jiang, who strongly opposed accepting it. On April 19th, Li Zongren officially refused to sign the internal peace accords. On the evening of April 20th, the communist army launched a full attack and the peace talks broke down. Mao Zedong ordered the communist army to cross the Yangtze River. In the early morning of April 23rd, Li Zongren left Nanjing and announced that the government would relocate to Guangzhou. On the 24th, the communists occupied Nanjing. Back in 1949, the nationalist government had moved the capital from Chongqing back to Nanjing. Now, less than four years later, they were forced to leave again. While Li Zongren was striving for peace, the newly resigned Jiang returned to his hometown in Fenghua, living in a mountain villa. He spent the Chinese New Year in his hometown, something he hadn't done for 36 years. During the three months he spent in Fenghua, Jiang Kai-shek and his eldest son Jiang Jingguo often enjoyed the beautiful landscape together. Though Jiang appeared relaxed, he was not. Rather, he was constantly considering his next move. 
共匪继续加紧的叛乱，和平既然没有紧的叛乱。During this period, Jiang traveled a lot, but this was different from any ordinary travel. His purpose was to use this time to relax his mind and try to find solutions to his problems. During the three months in Fenghua, Jiang kept himself busy. He gave an order for a telegraph machine to be installed so he could continue to command the Nationalist Army. To my knowledge, he had two machines installed, one in his mountain villa and the other one in the cottage near his mother's grave. Through telegraph and telephone, Jiang continued to control the situation as KMT chairman. Fenghua became another center of power. Senior party members visited him frequently for advice. Jiang had resigned, but he did not really step down. He chose to work behind the scenes. Even though Jiang had resigned, he did not resign his position as KMT chairman. So he continued to control the party. One feature of the way the KMT ruled China was the one-party system. The party has higher authority than the government. It controlled the government. Since Chiang Kai-shek remained chairman of the KMT, one can say he did not completely give up his power. Jiang once said wherever he was, that was the decision-making nucleus. The location of the national capital didn't really matter. For a long time, senior officials in the government had the habit of consulting Jiang for almost every decision. In December 1948, Jiang appointed Chen Cheng to be Taiwan provincial governor and provincial garrison commander. The evening before his resignation, on January 21, 1949, he appointed Tang Anbo to be the commander of troops in Nanjing, Shanghai, and Hangzhou, Zhang Chun to be the commander in Chongqing, and Yu Han Mo to be the commander in Guangzhou. Such arrangements showed that Zhang was planning to retreat to Sichuan, Guangdong, and Taiwan. Zhang's defense strategy was to keep the areas along the Yangtze River and Shanghai. If that was not possible, then the next line would be Guangzhou, Chongqing, and Taiwan. His personnel arrangement showed that Taiwan was not the only choice in his defense deployment. Jiang Kai-shek told Jiang Jingguo, We can move to another place, a smaller place, for a new start to restore the country. By a smaller place, I believe that Jiang Kai-shek was referring to Taiwan. What was noteworthy was that in fall 1948, government officials and supplies were gradually moved to Taiwan. In August, Air Force headquarters. In September, the confidential archives of the Office of the President. In November, the National Palace Museum. In December, the central engraving and printing plants in Taglio printing machines. All these movements indicated that Jiang considered Taiwan to be an important location. Jiang had a good impression of Taiwan. Firstly, Taiwan was not penetrated by the communists at the time. Secondly, strategically speaking, Taiwan and China were separated by the strait. The communists did not have an air force or a strong navy, so it would not be easy for them to attack Taiwan. Finally, Zhang's followers, including Zhang Qiyun, Chen Cheng, Tao Xiseng, and his son Zhang Jingguo, all suggested he first retreat to Taiwan 
and then try to defeat the communists. The military deployment, the personnel arrangement, and the move to transfer gold reserves to Taiwan all showed that Chiang Kai-shek had planned to retreat to Taiwan. On the night of December 1, 1948, Shanghai's Bund was under heavy guard. After midnight, laborers carried one wooden box after another from the basement of the Bank of China. The only house along the banks of the Huangpu River, designed by a Chinese, was the Bank of China. Its basement was built in 1937. At that time, it was known as the biggest treasury in the Far East, and the vault stored loads of gold. The laborers walked along the lane between the Heping Hotel's North Building and Bank of China, carrying the heavy wooden boxes to the customs preventive ship Sea Star. British journalist George Vine witnessed it all. On the following day, Vine sent a wire to London stating, all the Chinese government's gold was being removed by laborers. By December 3rd, because of the news issued by Reuters, the entire world knew that most of the Chinese government's gold had been shipped out of Shanghai. However, most Chinese newspapers in Shanghai did not dare to publish the news, except a few left-wing newspapers. In fact, this was not the only time this happened. Under the order of President Chiang Kai-shek, the governor of the central bank, Yu Hongjun, secretly used the Sea Star to ship loads of gold and silver to Taiwan. When the news about the gold shipment was published, the consequences were severe. People in Shanghai became anxious. To calm them, the Bank of China allowed the people to exchange gold at a price lower than the black market. However, this move led to a run on the bank that shocked the world. The price in the black market was 10 times more than the official price. So everyone rushed to exchange for gold. Tragedies happened when people got killed in the crowd. It was so crowded that the bodies could not even fall on the ground. But the gold shipment did not stop. On January 10, 1949, Jiang ordered Wu Songqing, financial director of the Combined Logistics Command, to ask the central bank for advance payment of military expenses to allow shipment of the remaining gold and silver. My father, Wu Songqing, was given an order to withdraw the gold and silver from the state treasury. However, under the Constitution, the president's order alone was not enough to withdraw all the remaining money from the treasury. Hence, they used the request for advance payment of military expenses. In January 1949, Wu Songqing took charge to ship 990,000 taels of gold, 30 million pieces of silver coin, over 100 million taels of silver, and 70 million U.S. dollars to Xiamen. Part of the shipment was later moved to Taiwan, constituting the second gold shipment. In February 1949, the third gold shipment from Shanghai to Taiwan included a total of 600,000 taels of gold. In May, right before Shanghai was occupied by the communists, Jiang Jingguo and Tang Anbo moved the last 200,000 taels of gold and over 10 million taels of silver. When the communists took over Shanghai, it was said that only 5,000 taels of gold were left in the vault. According to Wu Xingyong, approximately 4 million taels of gold were shipped to Taiwan, including silver and U.S. dollars, 
The total value was about 500 million US dollars at the time. According to central bank statistics, about 2.95 million tails of gold were shipped to Taiwan. The most important expenditure was the 800,000 tails of gold appropriated to the Bank of Taiwan as the gold reserve to issue new Taiwan dollars. This gold shipment was one of the key factors that helped Taiwan get through the political turmoil and inflation. Events in Korea would reinforce Taiwan's position as an important link in the free world's chain of defense. The direction of the gold shipment was clear, but the future location of the nationalist government was yet undecided. The executive yuan, for example, was first moved from Nanjing to Guangzhou, later to Chongqing and Chengdu, then finally settled in Taipei. Apparently, Chiang Kai-shek was not going to let go of China so soon. Jiang felt that once the government was moved to Taiwan, the last connection with China would be cut off. As long as the nationalist government still kept a space in the mainland, it symbolized that the nationalist government still owned China. Jiang wanted to use Taiwan as a base to fight the communists, but he did not want to give up territory in China. Since the end of 1948, the government had been planning to move the capital to Guangzhou. Starting from January 16, 1949, two trains shuttled between Nanjing and Shanghai every day, transporting over 10,000 civil servants and their families to Shanghai. Ministry of National Defense employee Yu De Chang was one of them. I retreated from Nanjing to Shanghai in January 1949. We waited in Shanghai for about a week, and then we took the military ship to Guangzhou. This was the time when the Ministry of National Defense was relocated to Guangzhou. When we took the train from Nanjing to Shanghai, many people who could not get in would stay on the roof of the train. Unfortunately, when the train went through the tunnel, many people on the roof fell off and died. On January 15th, the executive yuan made a decision that all governmental agencies would keep only 5 to 10 percent of personnel. Elderly and those who voluntarily resigned would be given severance pay and travel expenses. In Nanjing, the Ministry of National Defense originally had over 400 employees, but following relocation to Guangzhou, a little over 100 remained. Promotion was thus very easy. Once there was a vacant position, a person would get promoted. I was just a second lieutenant in Nanjing. Then I was promoted to first lieutenant in Guangzhou. By the time we went to Chongqing, I became a major. In 1949, the government was first moved to Guangzhou. After it was moved to Guangzhou, the government decided to have two separate offices. In other words, business was conducted separately in Chongqing and Taiwan. Documents and records were not shipped directly from Guangzhou to Taiwan. This was why so many documents and records got left behind in China. The reason behind this circuitous journey was not just the intention of the government, but also the international situation. It was clear at the time that Chiang Kai-shek had nowhere to go but Taiwan. At the same time, there was another concern inside the KMT. They were concerned that the Americans might use this opportunity to take over Taiwan. The U.S. feared Taiwan would be caught in the Chinese Civil War, damaging its strategic deployment in East Asia. 
If the communists liberated Taiwan, their navy would be based in Kaohsiung, not far from the Philippines. This would threaten the U.S.'s West Pacific defense in the Far East. So the Americans certainly hoped Taiwan wouldn't be occupied by the communists. It was clear the government's choice to move to Taiwan was not simply because of domestic problems, but also due to complex international relations and the balance of military power in Asia. Jiang had to be extremely careful. On April 22nd, before Nanjing fell to the communists, Li Zongren flew to Hangzhou and had a high-level meeting with Jiang. Li believed that the failure of peace talks and the relocation of the government were all caused by Jiang Kai-shek's reluctance to give up all his power. And so he was about to talk to Jiang about it. However, Jiang took the initiative. When he met Li Zongren, he took out a telegraph draft to form the Central Emergency Council. This was a way to bind Li to him. To solve the problems of lack of coordination within the party and multiple leadership, a decision was made to set up the Central Emergency Council under the KMT Central Standing Committee. Jiang and Li would be chairman and vice chairman, respectively. Jiang intended to use the Central Emergency Council to get his power back. On the other hand, he also wanted to improve coordination between the party and the government. In the KMT, government policies were led by the party. So on the surface, the Central Emergency Council was formed to help Li. Li agreed to the formation of the council, but the fact was that Li had no choice but to agree. As Li did not oppose the decision, Jiang Kai-shek, as the chairman, would have the greatest power. Nanjing had fallen. Zhejiang was also about to be taken. On April 25th, Zhang decided to leave his hometown, Fenghua. Before his departure, he visited his mother's grave twice and wrote in his diary of his reluctance to leave. He felt as if his mother was telling him to stay. In his mind, Jiang knew clearly that he might never return again. At 3 p.m. on April 25th, Jiang Kai-shek and his son left Fenghua and drove to Ninghai on the Zhejiang coast. They took the bamboo raft at the beach and then took a motorboat to the destroyer Tai Kong. Jiang Kai-shek took my bamboo raft on that day. He opened up the map and asked me, here in the south, what is the name of this place? I answered, Shi Che Ko, which means magpie's mouth. Jiang was glad to hear my answer and said, magpies are lucky. That means we can get to Taiwan safely. When my bamboo raft approached the motorboat, soldiers on the boat welcomed Jiang Kai-shek with really loud voices. Once on board, Jiang ordered the ship to Shanghai, where fighting was fierce. The next day, Tai Kong was anchored at Fuxing Island, off the coast of Shanghai. Jiang instructed all the generals regarding strategy and deployment. On April 27th, Jiang entered Shanghai and made an announcement to the military and the people, asking them to support the war against the communists. This was in fact an announcement that Jiang was back in command. Acting President Li Zongren did not follow the government to Guangzhou. Instead, he flew back to his hometown Guilin in Guangxi province, choosing not to be a leader in Guangzhou. Li felt that the Central Emergency Council was merely Jiang's attempt to mitigate his power. Moreover, over the past months, he'd been unable to implement his policy. On May 3rd, senior party members, including Zhu Zheng and Yan Shishan, 
visited Guilin and told Li Zongren to think about the big picture. They asked him to fly to Guangzhou to lead the government. At their meeting, Li made six demands. Li Zongren wrote a minute of dialogue. In this minute of dialogue, he made six demands. He asked Zhu Zheng and Yan Shishan to bring the document to Zhang. Li demanded Zhang hand over control of finances, military, and personnel. He also demanded Zhang leave the country. Zhang was very angry when he received the demands. He refuted that acting President Li had the control. He had nothing to hand over. In his diary, Zhang felt that the six demands made by Li Zongren were stricter and harsher than the internal peace accords proposed by the communists. In his reply to Li, Jiang Kai-shek said he had long handed over all his power and had nothing left to hand over. As for leaving the country, he would never consent to that. However, he was willing to distance himself from the center of power. Yan Shishan visited Guilin again. When Li Zongren picked him up at the airport, he informed Li that Zhang had agreed to almost all of his demands. Li flew to Guangzhou on May 8th and continued to exercise his power as the acting president. Zhang also fulfilled his promise to distance himself from the center of power and took the ship Jiang Jing out to sea. Li Zongren kept pushing for Jiang to leave the country. When Jiang boarded the ship, even his son had no idea where they were going. They stayed at sea for 10 days. In his diary, Jiang Jingguo wrote, I felt lost. In May, we just traveled back and forth between islands as if we were clouds. Is this life? For the others, this was a journey with no destination. For Zhang, however, the answer was clear. During the 10 days, he visited the Zhoushan Islands and while on the ship, thought about how to have a fresh start. Finally, he decided that the Zhoushan Islands, Taiwan and Fujian would be the base for the battle against the communists. May 7th was the first day Jiang boarded the ship Jiang Jing. The main content of his diary focused on the construction of Taiwan. On May 17th, Jiang flew to Penghu and visited the military port. On the 25th, he flew to Gongshan in Kaohsiung. Finally, he stayed in the Grass Mountain Chateau in Taipei and made plans for the future reforms of the party, government, and military. A series of defeats led to political turmoil in Guangzhou, and He Yingqin resigned his position as the premier. Originally, Li Zongren had nominated Zhu Zheng to be the premier, but his nomination failed in the legislative yuan by a margin of one vote. Li nominated Yan Shishan for premier. Yan Shishan became premier because he was a choice that both Jiang Kai-shek and Li Zongren could accept. While the government was struggling to nominate officials, the People's Republic of China was established and communist troops were getting closer to Guangzhou. On October 10th, the fighting was close enough for Guangzhou to hear the bombing. 
On the 12th, the government decided to move the executive yuan to Chongqing. When we boarded the plane to leave Guangzhou, a guard with a gun wanted to get onto the plane as well. We refused his request. As we closed the gate and told the pilot to take off, the guard shot at the plane. Just as in the Second Sino-Japanese War, the nationalist government was moved to Chongqing. At the same time, Taiwan organized National Day ceremonies for the Republic of China. Nobody could be sure if this would be the last time they celebrated National Day. Jiang was in Taipei, but because he did not hold any position in the government, he did not attend the ceremony. At 4 a.m. that morning, Jiang got up and prayed. He randomly flipped through the pages of the Bible and asked the Lord about the future of the Republic of China. The page he got was Acts 9.41, which stated that Peter helped raise Dorcas from the dead, a symbol of resurrection. Jiang wrote in his diary, I thank the Lord for allowing the Republic of China to return from danger to peace. And through the hands of your loyal follower Kai Shek, the Republic of China will have new life. Over 10 days later, the only piece of good news in a year arrived. Military forces stationed in Jinmen had repelled a communist attack, proof that they would be unable to cross the strait and attack Taiwan in the near future. Military forces and ordinary people in Taiwan felt relieved. However, when Zhang first heard the good news, he could not believe it. He checked the intelligence over and over again, as he feared that this might be a lie made up by the armed forces at the front. It was not until Zhang Jingguo's visit to Jinmen that he actually believed that the Nationalist Army had won the battle. The war in China, however, was deteriorating. On November 3rd, Li Zongren left Chongqing, the location of the government, and returned to Guilin through Kunming. He then claimed to have suffered from gastric bleeding and flew to Hong Kong for treatment. On December 5th, Li, as the acting president, flew to the U.S. for treatment. Before his departure, he asked Premier Yan Shishan to be in charge of the government. When the country was in danger, Li Zongren walked out on his people and their belief in him. After Li left Chongqing, the government was in need of a leader. Hence, senior officials called Jiang Kai-shek, asking him to return and lead the government. On November 14th, Jiang flew from Taipei to Chongqing to be the leader. On November 28th, seeing that Chongqing would soon be occupied, government officials urgently moved west to Chengdu. Even though he knew that he could not reverse the deteriorating situation, Jiang continued to be the leader as the chairman of the Central Emergency Council and stayed in Chongqing for the last struggle. Jiang insisted on staying in Chongqing and he would not leave. At 10 p.m. on November 29th, Jiang could hear gunshots from his residence in Chongqing. He finally left the residence and went to the airport to fly to Chengdu. The communist army was less than 13 kilometers away. If Chongqing fell into the hands of the communists, the government's plan was to move to Xichang, 
but they would first stop in Chengdu. However, intelligence showed that the communists were already in Xichang. Unable to go to Xichang, on December 7th, under Jiang's instruction, the executive Yuan decided to move from Chengdu to Taiwan. On the following day, Premier Yan Shan and the cabinet flew to Taipei. On December 10th, the sound of bombing could already be heard in Chengdu. At 2 p.m., Jiang Kai-shek's plane took off and took him away from the place he had once commanded. At 8.30 p.m., Jiang arrived in Taipei. One wonders if he knew that he would spend the rest of his life on this small island. Resolute in spirit and confident that man's inherent love of freedom and justice will emerge victorious, our forces will fight on. History recalls with devastating truth that right will prevail. Russia will never know one day of peace in China. Russia will never own China. China will remain free. In January 1950, Song Mei Ling left the U.S. disappointed and with no hope of any aid from the U.S. She returned to Taiwan to be with her husband during a time of national crisis. The Republic of China was like a candle in the wind. In his diary on January 25th, Zhang wrote, If Taiwan falls into the hands of the communists, I will definitely die in Taiwan to fulfill my responsibility. For him, there was no turning back. On December 9, 1949, Premier Yan Shan held an Executive Yuan Council at the Taipei Guest House. This was the first Executive Yuan Council ever held in Taiwan. From this day on, the Republic of China began its rule in Taiwan. This seal of the Republic of China made from green jade and this seal of honor made from white jade are the symbols of the Republic of China's transfer of power. During the turmoil of 1949, the two seals were moved from Nanjing and arrived at Chongqing with the government. Peng Xiang, director of the first bureau of the office of the president and in charge of guarding the seals, left China and went to Hong Kong during the war. The responsibility fell on the shoulders of the deputy director, Zhu Da Chang. When Chongqing was on the verge of being taken over, Zhu took the seals to Chengdu. So many people and supplies were moving to Chengdu at that time. It was really chaotic. My father, Zhu Da Chang's job was to guard the seals, and it was a big responsibility. Unfortunately, Chengdu was also in danger, so Zhu hurriedly brought the two national treasures to Taiwan, where it was safer. The government sent a plane to Chengdu and helped remove the seals. My father took the plane and flew to Hainan Island, where he stayed for six days. It was said that the news that he was carrying the seals had been known, and the safety of the seals might be jeopardized. He feared that the seals would be robbed or stolen, so he never left the seals. When he slept, he put the seals under his pillow. On December 11th, Zhu arrived safely in Jiayi with the seals. The two treasures continue to be national symbols in Taiwan.
The seals were here, but the head of state was not. The country faced the awkward situation of having seals, but no leaders. Acting President Li Zongren continued to stay in the U.S., but felt that he could continue to exercise his presidential powers while there. Secretary General of the Office of the President, Chiu Changwei, corresponded frequently with Li via telegraph. Li claimed he never ceased to read all the telegraphs and gave instructions and orders. His stay in the U.S. did not affect his functioning of the government. The KMT and government kept urging Li Zongren to return, but the fact was the Republic of China in Taiwan did not have a national leader. Deputy Premier Zhu Jiahua submitted his resignation letter to Li Zongren. Premier Yan Shishan followed suit in February 1950, citing difficulties in running the government. Once the resignation was granted, the government would have no leader at all. The situation was getting worse. The acting president didn't want to return, and the premier felt that he couldn't always act as the head of state. The government was without a nucleus of leadership. Zhang blamed acting president Li Zongren for his stay in the U.S. He questioned Li's ability to continue to be the acting president. During this predicament, Jiang wanted to resume his power and lead the country through the crisis. The problem was how to resume office when he had already resigned. He needed a constitutional way that nobody would oppose. Jiang asked the president of the Judicial Yuan, Wang Chonghui, to hold a meeting with all the justices and study the legitimacy for his resumption of office. The conclusion was that in Jiang's announcement for resignation, he stated the reason was, for any cause, be unable to attend to his official duties. The cause at the time meant the peace talks with the communists. Since the peace talks had failed, there was no reason why Jiang couldn't resume the presidency. At the time when the peace talks failed, the cause for Jiang's resignation had disappeared, but the government didn't ask Jiang to resume office. Jiang even sent a letter to Li Zongren, asking him to continue as acting president. That showed Jiang's resumption of the presidency was illegitimate. However, I can fully understand why the government would provide the legitimate reason. What else could they say? Hence, on March 1, 1950, Jiang announced his resumption of the presidency and continued to exercise the powers of the president. However, the government he led was fighting the red tide of communism alone. The U.S. was the only country with the power to prevent all of East Asia from falling into the hands of the communists but it had chosen to be indifferent and wait for the Chinese Civil War to end. As for the Chinese Civil War in 1949, the U.S. believed that the KMT was so corrupted and Chiang Kai-shek had failed to lead his party. So, ultimately, the communists would win. They were ready to recognize communist China. As the president has stated, we are not going to use our forces in connection with the present situation in Formosa. We are not going to attempt to seize the island. We are not going to get involved militarily in any way on the island of Formosa. Hatchison saw a meeting Atchison announced publicly that the defense line of the U.S. in East Asia did not include Taiwan or the Korean Peninsula. The U.S.'s West Pacific defense line started from the Aleutians through Guam, Japan to the Philippines. Korea and Taiwan were not included. Kim Il-sung, Mao Zedong and Stalin believed that the U.S. did not intend to interfere in the Chinese Civil War. Also, the defensive line did not include Korea, so they started the Korean War.
On June 25, 1950, the Korean War broke out. The U.S.'s China policy completely changed. Originally, it had decided to give up Taiwan, but now it decided to support Jiang. To prevent the communists from expanding their realm, the U.S. decided to resume their cooperation with Jiang and establish a new relationship. They also discovered that Jiang's rule in Taiwan was not as corrupt as it was in China. On June 27th, the Seventh Fleet moved to the Taiwan Strait. This marked the beginning of the standoff between the nationalists and the communists. Meanwhile, the Chinese Civil War became part of the Cold War between the U.S. and the USSR. In 1949, a year of crisis, the Republic of China weathered the challenges and continued to be a country on the island of Taiwan.